Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to another Red Hat OpenShift Commons briefing. And this time, we're going to talk about bringing Red Hat OpenShifts to the IBM Cloud with Chris Rosen. I'm going to let Chris introduce himself and take us on a tour and talk about his journey with uh, OpenShift on IBM Cloud and give us a bit of a demo. And there'll be live Q&A at the end. So, Chris, take it away. All right. Thank you, Diane. Appreciate it. Uh, Thanks everyone for joining. My name is Chris Rosen. I am the Program Director of Offering Management, responsible for all things containers and microservices related running in IBM Cloud. So really excited today to kind of go through a few slides on what is the actual offering. And then I think more exciting, we'll get into the actual demo. And if you're watching this after the fact, feel free to reach out with any questions or comments. You can see my email and my Twitter handle are both listed on this page. So before I get into the actual technology, I want to quickly touch on use cases because when we're developing offerings, you know, it's it's cool when we build new things and new widgets and new capabilities, but the reality is if they're not solving some of our customers' problems, then, you know, really what's the premise of doing that? So when we're building things like Red Hat OpenShift on IBM Cloud, uh, from here on I'll basically just call it Managed OpenShift for short because it is quite a long name what are the use cases that we're really trying to identify and the first one is really about innovation and it's enabling our users who are generally developers and they're building new applications and they need to be able to do so and move quickly and automate everything in their ci cd pipeline so that way it's all source code uh, controlled and they've got the right teams that have the right access to be able to make those pushes and changes and, and do so in a very secure manner. So some of the offerings that we build around this use case are of course using the managed OpenShift. We see some things like IBM Cloud Functions for our event-driven serverless, and obviously that's a very dynamic space as we get into Knative starting to become more prevalent in those use cases. And really enabling developers with CI-CD tooling Things like the IBM Garage, if that's a new term to you, it's basically a way that, think of it as IBM's consultant branch where they'll go out and they'll work with our customers through a garage session. And what that means is the customer brings their real problem. I'm trying to solve X. And you'll go through a design thinking session where at the end of it, you'll have a thousand post-it notes all over the walls. And you think about, how to solve your problem, what's the ultimate lighthouse kind of solution for it. Then you sit down and pair program with IBMers, and by the end of that session, you have a real prototype. So what's great is it's not just a you know a workshop where you're getting hands-on with the technology, although that's very valuable as well. This is actually solving your problems, and at the end, you've got a prototype. You're thinking about how do I solve these, not only technically, but then generally the biggest hurdle is culturally. How do I adopt in this more cloud native DevOps, DevSecOps type world? And the garage helps our customers through that transformation. And then the second one that I want to mention is really about app modernization. And there are different flavors in that spectrum. Do I simply want to repackage my existing app as a container and get some benefits around packaging and deployment and monitoring and logging? Or is it worth the investment to completely refactor to microservices and run that in a truly cloud native application? And you'll see a lot of consistency, obviously, with the solutions running in IBM Cloud to help solve that. And Red Hat OpenShift on IBM Cloud being our, our lead offering, the lead landing spot for those containerized workloads, whether they are brand new cloud native apps or if they're coming in from a modernization sales play effort. So let's get into the actual offering. You know, we've been running managed Kubernetes and containerized workloads for nearly five years in IBM Cloud uh, through several iterations. And so we're excited when we launched this offering on August 1st, 2019, after, you know, the acquisition with Red Hat and bringing them on board. So we're excited to bring all of the value of OpenShift. So IBM's not done anything to OpenShift Red Hat, and we provide all of the same capabilities as the managed service. 
OpenShift obviously could run on any infrastructure and any cloud. So how do we make it optimized and the best landing spot to be able to run those workloads in public cloud? So that's really our focus is bringing the, the value to this managed service. So we leverage our existing SRE management capabilities for the 20,000 plus production clusters that we're running, and we bring that to managed OpenShift. And so you'll see some things around not only the day one deployment of your compute, your networks, your storage, but then day two lifecycle management, whether it's a RHEL patch, anything in that stack, whether it's OpenShift itself, which obviously Red Hat vets and make sure that those things, that updates are validated and ready, or anything in that entire stack. IBM's gonna manage that lifecycle for you. And you'll think about kind of the line of roles and responsibilities, where as a customer, you wanna focus on those use cases, whether it is delivering innovation or app modernization. So let IBM manage the infrastructure in the lifecycle, so that way you can focus on solving your line of business objectives. Some of the things we're very focused on building in operational characteristics to the offering. So things like with every cluster having highly available masters and with a multi-zone cluster, now I'm distributing masters and worker nodes across three different data centers in a given IBM cloud region. So for example, if there were some catastrophic network outage in one of those data centers, well, my API endpoint is still accessible. I still have workloads running in those other two data centers, and then I could auto scale out to get to the right capacity required to run those workloads. So my end users don't know that there was an outage or that there was an upgrade happening. So as I update from one version to the next, we seamlessly roll through that upgrade. So that way, again, it's a seamless for the end user experience. Compliance is something that we take very seriously in IBM Cloud as well. Our managed OpenShift offering went at GA'd back on August 1st, had all the things around SOC 1, SOC 2, Type 1 and Type 2, HIPAA readiness, PCI compliance. And compliance is a two-way street. So obviously, you know, we've got responsibility to control the, the, the compute side of this and you as a user have responsibility as well and how do you maintain access and encryption and all of those capabilities within the workloads running inside your clusters isolation choices including bare metal so if you need that amount of resource or gpu or 10 gig bonded ethernet you can get that as a part of the managed service and then the last point here is an industry leading 99.99% SLA for that multi-zone cluster. So because all of our control plane and most of the services running in IBM Cloud have standardized to run on top of Kubernetes, that built-in resiliency and availability has allowed the platform to increase its SLA to the 99.99. On the far right, bringing the fact that OpenShift, as I said earlier, is OpenShift consistently wherever you run it. That's the real value prop of hybrid cloud and multi-cloud and using OpenShift as that platform. Now I can consistently run workloads wherever I want to run and wherever I have IaaS. The far right column is really talking about taking that platform and integrating it to the IBM cloud capabilities. So things like bring your own key with IBM Key Protect or keep your own key with IBM HyperProtect services. And the difference there being with keep your own key, it's FIPS 140-2 level four encryption. We're the only public cloud to be able to get that level of encryption. And customers own the keys. So even though it's a managed service from IBM, we don't have access to your data. If you lose the keys, we have to replace the physical HSM that stores those keys. So depending on the level of encryption and isolation of those workloads, our users can determine which level works best for their use cases and requirements. And they may mix and match depending on different projects or different life cycles of an application. This chart, uh, you know, obviously there's a lot of words here, but we start to, when we think about the word managed, and at least in IBM, the word managed means something different to everyone. For a cloud managed service, essentially what it means is that we're taking off a lot of the operational burden for our users and that 
instantiation of the cluster originally or that ongoing updates and lifecycle management. Tying out with the rest of the platform so that way as you start to focus and build or add cognitive capabilities to your apps and you want to bind a Watson service or create a chatbot or use weather data or IoT or analytics, you can securely consume those within your Red Hat OpenShift on IBM Cloud cluster and just extend those apps, make them work smarter, work better with the existing code base that you have and now you're leveraging these higher value services from IBM Cloud. We'll show uh, a lot of these things in the demo, but quickly just to kind of, you know, talk through a few of these points. The first one is around simplified cluster management. You know, you'll see there's a, a lovely UI where you can point and click through things, but the reality is most of my users will do that once, and then they're going to automate that either through the CLI or the API. We also have IBM Cloud Schematics, which is our infrastructure as code based on Terraform and soon Ansible to do that deployment in a consistent manner of your clusters, of your lifecycle management. We talked about highly available masters, user-controlled worker node management. And that's a mouthful, but essentially what that means is that IBM is providing all of the tooling, but our users determine when is the best time to upgrade. So if they're running on, for example, OpenShift 4.3, and we say, hey, 4.4 .4 is available, they determine when is the right time for them. And even though we'll roll through, like I mentioned earlier, they still control and determine when that upgrade will take place. All they need to do is click the button and then we take care of the rest of the magic for them. Essentially the way it works is we take the first node, we drain all the deployed pods from it. Once it's quarantined, then we reload it top to bottom. When it's online and healthy, we move on to the second node, third node, so on and so forth until we've completely rolled through your cluster's capacity. We also support worker node auto recovery. You know, the reality is we're just dealing with hardware and software, so things can and will go wrong. So it's really about, again, simplifying the operations, building in that, that chaos monkey mentality when we're building our apps and ensuring that they are architected to be able to handle those types of failures and outages. And then the last thing is worker node auto scaling. So as you need to add additional capacity, you can do so and control when to scale up or down. Designing your own cluster, you know, it's really about, one is about compute isolation choice. In IBM Cloud, you could have shared compute, which is a single tenant virtual machine, multi-tenant hypervisor hardware. Just think of any public cloud VM. We also have what's called dedicated compute, where it's single tenant VM hypervisor hardware. So I'm the only tenant running on a physical piece of hardware in IBM Cloud. And then the last option is bare metal. Like I said earlier, if you need that amount of compute and resources in one node, you can get that as a part of the managed service. The other thing that we provide are something called edge nodes. And think about this as really just minimizing the attack surface of your cluster. So instead of one worker pool where everything is running, now I've got an edge pool and all of my inbound and outbound traffic route through this. There's my IPS and my IDS are all running. My actual containerized workloads are in a fully separate pool that only have private IBM backbone networking. So again, just adds a layer of protection from your workload. Security and isolation, you know, obviously we could spend an hour on this one. A few other things that we, we enable here for our users, we use Lux encryption by default on all of the secondary drives where your containers are running. If you are running some high performance workload, you could opt out of that or, you know, whether it's at the worker pool or cluster level. So you can determine the amount of encryption and the isolation that we talked about before. We also integrate with image signing with Red Hat Notary. So that way you can ensure that images have not been tampered with from container registry to deployment. The fourth thing is around extending your apps with IBM Cloud Services. And I, I briefly touched this earlier where IBM is really focused on these higher value services. We acquired the weather company a handful of years now because weather impacts all of us. 
or other industries, having that weather data can make our app smarter and they can make our engagement models more, more engaging with our end users. So we're really focused on that. Uh, the other thing that I'll mention here, and we'll see this in the demo, are things like integrating with IBM Cloud Identity and Access Management. So now I can be very fine-grained and prescriptive over the amount of control that I give users because some of my customers will create different clusters for different teams or different stages of that application's life cycle, but other customers will create a larger internally multi-tenant cluster such that within that I've got different projects and I've got team A in this project and then I've got team B in this one and I can give access down to that project level. So it allows me to control and leverage my underlying resources much more efficiently. The fifth thing, you know, open source, obviously very important to IBM and Red Hat. Both have not only been core contributors to these technologies, but also consume and build our commercial offerings on top of open source. So that was, you know, really obviously Red Hat and IBM have been partners for over 20 years and bringing the acquisition last year just brings that to a closer relationship where we both continue to contribute and run these open source projects. So I think that's great. Uh, when I talk to customers, obviously they want this whole eliminating vendor lock-in and that's what container technology has given them. So now they've got that ability to package up their apps and all their dependencies and have that movement. But the reality is these open source projects are hard. When you look at all of the components that go into OpenShift and into our managed OpenShift offering, there are a lot of open source projects. So let IBM and Red Hat handle the complexity. So if an update in one community, ensuring that it doesn't adversely affect anything else in the stack or making sure that when new updates are available that they are in fact secure, upgradable, operational, you know, all of those things that are important to you as end consumers of our offerings. And then the last thing is around integrated operational tools. As I've said several times, OpenShift is a platform, so there's a lot that comes baked into OpenShift itself to have that consistently, consistency anywhere that it's running. In IBM Cloud, we also have managed services, whether it's monitoring or logging or security tools that can live outside of the life cycle of an individual cluster you can also leverage those from other compute choices or other solutions, whether it's in IBM Cloud, other cloud or on-prem to give you operationally that consistency. Now, the great thing is that if your customers have already chosen some other vendor to provide monitoring or logging or security or CICD, you know, fantastic. No one is advocating that you scrap what you've invested in in those technologies. You can deploy those very easily and OpenShift and send those metrics out to your, you know, the source of truth, whether it's a SaaS offering or something running on-prem. And again, your operations teams don't need to learn a new model of managing an environment, even though they may be running Red Hat OpenShift on IBM Cloud for the first time. It's really about consistency and easing that adoption curve. One quick topic before I jump into the demo is around IBM Cloud Packs. And I wanna talk about that briefly just to kind of make sure everyone is aware of what we're doing and I'm sure we'll have a deeper dive into these as we proceed through these sessions. A Cloud Pack is basically think about IBM bringing its standard middleware stack of applications and capabilities to a containerized ecosystem. And from a cloud pack, if I'm a software seller, I obviously want to be able to sell that cloud pack, that solution to run on any OpenShift environment in any of these public clouds in a consistent manner. So OpenShift becomes that vehicle to provide IBM cloud packs in your data center in IBM cloud or any of these other public clouds that are listed here. Today, there are six cloud packs. You know, each of the cloud packs are really targeted toward an individual kind of use case or mission. So for example, let's just use Cloud Pack for multi-cloud management as our example. And coming back to this relationship with Red Hat and IBM, Red Hat owns the multi-cloud management, open source technology, they're developing it, 
then the cloud pack around it, which includes that and some other capabilities as well. So now I deploy this cloud pack for multi-cloud management and it gives me insight to my clusters running in different clouds. It gives me governance. It gives me access in a, through a single pane of glass to these regardless of where they're actually running. So as I said, each of these cloud packs can run anywhere. My challenge as the offering owner in IBM Public Cloud is how do we make IBM Cloud the best place and most optimized place to not only run OpenShift, but also cloud packs. So the things that we've already talked about with managed OpenShift around our compliance and our security isolation, all of that operational experience, that's all consistently true uh, here as well to run that cloud packs. But a few other things that we've done to make it easier. The first thing is around discoverability. And that's really with our IBM Cloud Content Catalog, bringing content or software as a first class citizen to IBM Cloud. So now you would discover all of the cloud packs that are out there, other software from IBM and Red Hat. So discoverability is easier. Now I find this cloud pack from Multi-Cloud Manager and I think, you know, that sounds pretty awesome. Let me deploy it. Now through a one-click installation with IBM Cloud Schematics, which as I mentioned earlier, that's our Terraform and soon to be Ansible based infrastructure as code offering, I can deploy that to an existing Red Hat OpenShift on IBM Cloud cluster. So now I've easily discovered it. Number two, I've easily deployed it. Now I'm running that Cloud Pack software stack in my OpenShift cluster. Now I've got all of the benefits around deploying and lifecycle management right here. And now I can leverage that Cloud Pack for what its real value is, whether it is a multi-cloud management solution or cloud pack for data, which is going to look at my existing data lakes and analyze that and help me make more cognitive and in-tuned decisions around that data to enhance my end user experience. So with that, let's jump over to a demo. I think, you know, that will speak louder to kind of what we've just talked through. Diane, I'm sure you'll jump and yell if you cannot see my web browser where I've, I've logged into IBM Cloud. You can see my overview dashboard of all of my resources, all the things that are happening, whether it's maintenance or my usage, my users, all that is a quick overview when I log into IBM Cloud. Let's jump into the catalog. And you'll see here, before I look at this, this software tab, that's what I talked about with all of bringing software as a first class citizen. I can select cloud packs and I can see all my cloud packs that are available. But let's go back and take a look at uh, the, the offerings because that's what we really want to demo here today. You can see right here under my featured or I could navigate under containers and I can see Red Hat OpenShift on IBM Cloud. Of course, my login has expired, so it always works out best for a demo when I have to log in in the middle. It's hard to plan that any better. So this will load here, and it'll take me back to my landing page for Red Hat OpenShift on IBM Cloud, where I've got some, as I get started, some basic cluster information. So what do I want to call this? Nothing better than calling it demo. Under resource group, here I could, this is what I talked about earlier with allocating resources to different people within my IBM Cloud account. So maybe this is gonna go to my prod resource group because this is a very important demo cluster. I could also tag it so that way I could find it later. As I scroll down here, you'll see location. Now here I've got single zone. We support all six of the existing multi-zone regions or MZRs for short, and 35 single zone regions or SCRs. So if I needed to deploy something in San Jose or in Montreal or Toronto, when I create a cluster there, the masters, the workers, everything remains in that boundary. So when I talk to customers in Canada, you know, especially, they need to ensure that data, logs, et cetera, are not leaving the Canadian boundary. So now they've got that option, they could deploy to Montreal or Toronto and have that, that isolation. You can see it's out here querying that I have no VLANs in those data centers, so it would go ahead and create one for me. Let's go back to multi-zone because I think that's slightly more interesting. 
finding that proportional capability at cluster creation time. So under geography, I can search whether I want to do AP or Europe. Uh, for this example, let's, let's just pick Europe. Under the metro, I can do London or Frankfurt. And we'll use Frankfurt here. So these are the three different data centers that I talked about. No VLANs there either, which is no problem. Let me scroll down. So now we've got our default worker pool. Uh, today, we're G8 on 3.11. When we developed this offering, it was during our acquisition quiet period. So we couldn't actually talk to Red Hat and say, hey, this is what we're going to build. What do you think? We had to go build it. Once the acquisition closed, then we could go back to the team and say, hey, look at this is how we run it. This is how we operationalize OpenShift and then go from there. Based on that, we needed to do some joint work with an open source project called the um, HyperShift Toolkit, which basically enables how IBM manages our infrastructure. And what that means is when we create this cluster, the master nodes deploy to my infrastructure account in a separate cluster than the worker nodes that deploy to your infrastructure account in a different cluster. So that's where this joint collaboration with Red Hat's OpenShift team and my team came into play to make that a reality. So now we're currently in an open beta on 4.3. Uh, we will GA on April 1st uh, here in just a few weeks. So we're very excited to be able to get this live and out the door for our customers. So let's use the beta because that's uh, more exciting. On the left-hand side, I've got some filters. So as I mentioned earlier, if I want that bare metal or different virtual machine isolation choices, I can select that. And then I could scroll through and read different, basically t-shirt sizes or flavors with a baked in amount of virtual CPU and memory. So we'll, let's just use a four by 16. Uh, here's the encryption, that Lux encryption that I talked about. You could turn it on or off. And then, you know, how many nodes do I want in each zone? So when I think about my Frankfurt 02, 04, and 06 data centers, by default, I'm gonna put three workers in each of those zones. And then the last little check is I've got an infrastructure permissions checker because if I'm running a multi-tenant account, maybe I've given you access, but I'm not allowing you to create and deploy resources. So then you would see a red X in here that says, you know, maybe you don't have the right permissions to create networks or storage. This is my account, so you can see that I can go ahead and deploy it. One thing that you'll notice that uh, because this is a beta, we're not metering and billing for the OpenShift license itself. Once we GA, all beta clusters will, will be removed after 30 days, and you'll have to redeploy new production clusters where we are, in fact, metering that. So I'm going to click Create, and it'll go off and churn. Once this jumps me out to the right page, you know, since that will be less exciting to watch that deploy, let's take a look at something that's already running in IBM Cloud. On my left-hand nav, you can see I can take a look at different uh, types of compute or resources that I'm running in the catalog. When I look at my OpenShift clusters landing page, here's the new guy. You can see him. He's off and churning and creating my master nodes and getting that ready to go. For this example, let's take a look at, uh, there we go. So when I look at my cluster again, I've got a big blurb across the top, which is, again, doesn't play very well in a, a demo, but it's telling me that this is a beta cluster and it will be purged after we GA. But I get a lot of relevant information to my cluster, the ID, the version, where it's running, my ingress subdomain, which is a very painful long name, I obviously, if I'm running production workloads, I'm gonna bring my own domain name to this, so that way it's just chrisazapp.com, not this whole big uh, arbitrary name. So you can do that as well. Under worker nodes, I can see additional detail around individual nodes. What's the flavor? What are their public and private VLANs? What's their hardware isolation choice? And this is where I would do lifecycle management. So here, I could select all three, and say update, and it's going to take me to 4.3.5, 1514, and say, yep, let's do it. So let's go ahead and do that update. And like I said earlier, it's going to roll through. It's going to take this first node offline, reload it, second node, third node, so on and so forth. Worker pools, it's a fairly common construct. 
fact, when when I, the first time I create a default pool, if I later said, well, the four by 16, it's not big enough. I need some larger, some additional capacity. Obviously I can't change that on the fly, but what I can do is create a new pool. So I call this pool two and I need this to have 16 by 16. Uh, my apps are very CPU intensive, so I need that. And here I could create a multi-zone pool or I could keep it as a single zone pool. So now it's all running in Dallas 10 in this example. Now I'm saying, yep, let's go ahead and create that. Let's jump back out. But it allows you, now in this model, if I wanted to, now I could delete the default pool and it essentially will automatically redeploy anything from that pool to the second one. So that's how I would grow and expand and add new capabilities. This other tab is called the add-ons tab. These are things that IBM is managing as a part of the overall offering. So we've got something called the diagnostics and debug tool. Uh, I'll open that up here. And that will essentially allow me to run some queries against routes and against other services that are a part of my managed service and make sure that they're running properly. Gives me some great insight. So as I start to troubleshoot things and try and figure out, you know, is it networking? Is it something in my YAML? Really try and identify the root cause of that problem. And then the last tab is DevOps. And so this is bringing from a broader view of uh, CICD tooling from IBM Cloud, which is moving toward the Tekton base. If I've got some workload, if I already had a CICD pipeline deploying to this cluster, it would show up here, but I don't. So this would allow me to create that tool chain that lives outside of that cluster. So now I could be deploying from from here to this cluster or to other clusters running anywhere consistently. So it kind of gives me that ability to control the CI/CD tooling, again, whether I want to do it directly in OpenShift or if I want to do it from an IBM Cloud Services capability. The last thing that I want to show, because I talked earlier about a native consistent user experience, which is obviously really important for our users. If you're using OpenShift on-prem or in any other cloud, you want the same capabilities when you come and try uh, Red Hat OpenShift on IBM Cloud. So things like making it easy one click to get out to the OpenShift console, you can do that. You, know, you may have seen that I got asked to re-authenticate again. Security, extremely important here at IBM, so we need to make sure that we're, we're checked and updated. But once I do get in, now I've got access to the same capabilities that you would see in OpenShift 4.3 anywhere. I've got my administrator view. I could go in here. I could discover operators. I could go up here to the dev console. I could look at my builds, my pipelines, my deployment topologies. I can see all of that in this cluster. So, you know, obviously this call is not meant to do a, a, an OpenShift 101. We're assuming that you already have that level of experience. And what I want to show is that it's the same capability, again, whether you want to do it from the UI or the CLI and start running OC commands, you can do that either model with that same consistency, that same ability to bring your existing YAMLs and apps and run that in Red Hat OpenShift on IBM Cloud, just as you would whether you're running on ARO or OpenShift on-prem or you stood up something on your own IaaS, consistency, simplifying that, that ease of getting started. So with that, I'll take a pause and see if we have any questions. There, there have not been any questions from outside, but I've actually learned quite a bit about things that I hadn't realized about the IBM offering, including um, the HA availability, bare metal and the edge stuff. So I think maybe when you get to the end of this, if you can talk a little bit more about how, how to go about using maybe the bare metal or that piece, and also um, totally blown away by um, getting to see 4.3 beta live demoed. So this is totally on target with what you're delivering. So keep on motoring on here. Excellent. That's, that's good, good to hear. The bare metal, so one of the differences that you'll see 
and it's the same flow if I create something like uh, some bare metal generally the use cases that we see there are two main ones today number one is you'll see some of these flavors and I can even uh, filter over here if I could find it extra storage for software defined storage and this is providing additional local disks you don't need to use file block or object storage from IBM cloud IaaS. it's directly built in to that flavor and now you can consume that one of our largest users runs all bare metal with this attached local disk so that way they have the ability to be able to run that workload keep all the data in proximity for much faster compute time the other use case is really around um, you know machine learning or we have a lot of data scientists that are running workloads and that allows them to run that in very you know resource intensive manner and what's great is that I don't have to be an IaaS admin when I deploy this. If I select this and it goes and deploys, IBM's gonna handle deploying that bare metal server and all of the life cycle. So to you as a consumer, it just looks like bare metal resources that I'm deploying my OpenShift worker nodes to, I'm running my workloads there. I could pin workloads to a particular pool or cluster if I needed to, to have access to that amount of compute and resources. That's awesome, um, and probably the easiest deployment on bare metal I've ever seen. Um, and so that's that's great to know. When, and just on um, on the support for 4.3, do you have a, a timeline for when that might go um, GA? Yes. Yeah, so we've we've been working with a number of um, customers on the beta, getting their feedback. Um, working very closely with the OpenShift team. They've just got us some fixes this week, so we're excited. Uh, we should have everything tied out with a GA announcement on April 1st. So everyone keep that between us friends right now and uh, stay tuned for all of the blog announcements and all of the Twitterverse noise that will happen when we are virtually popping champagne since we all have to be isolated from each other right now. Yes, I will be popping a, a bottle um, here at home as well. Um, it is an interesting choice of dates, April Fool's Day, so maybe uh, maybe it's auspicious, maybe it's not, but I'm really looking forward to seeing 4.3, uh, and you may actually be the, the first managed service um, to support that release, if I'm guessing my dates correctly. So um, that'll be really something to celebrate. I'm not seeing any other questions in the chat at the moment, hopefully. We will get more beta testers and a lot of people using this. Um, one of the things that always is, is the toughest is getting all those compl industry level um, compliance offerings. Um, and, and so I'm pretty impressed with, with that um, achievement on, on your half with OpenShift. So I think you're gonna see some real interesting um, use cases come your way. So looking forward to having you back again Soon, Chris, to hear from your customers and more feedback on OpenShift. So thank you very much for taking the time today. Absolutely, thank you very much. If anyone has questions afterwards, again, my contact information is up here and uh, we'd love to hear your feedback. So thank you.